we will speak about mental development or meditation in Buddhism as far as all of you ought to know. When we say as far as you ought to know, we don't mean just information and details about how to practice meditation, but we also mean that an understanding of this system of practice which can be used outside of Buddhism in other religions, other cultures, or what have you. An ancient fact which we ought to consider, a fact that goes back to the our ancestors in prehistory, is that culture, all cultures have been interrelated and interconnected in very complex ways. In the same way, the religions have been interconnected, interrelated, although they have not always been aware of this. And that because of this, there's the potential or possibility of all the religions bringing their diversity together and uniting as one. A similar fact to be noted is that although individual human beings are different on the outside, different in appearance, mannerisms, personality, and so forth. On the inside, they are fundamentally the same. That is, there are defilements arising, the defilements of lust, hatred, and delusion. And through, in this way, because of these defilements coming and going, human beings are inwardly basically the same. Another fact to consider (coughs) is that human beings are afraid that in all human beings, There is fear and the desire to get free of that which we fear. When this fear develops or progresses to the point that it's a fear of mental things, then there arises what we call religion. And so when all religion is related to this basic human experience of fear, they are very, very similar. The fears arising from material problems can be solved rather easily, but the fears arising from mental problems are very profound, subtle, and most difficult to remedy. And this is the work or responsibility of religions to solve these mental problems, the fears arising due to mental problems. When these kind of mental problems exist (coughs) and there is religion to deal with them, then what we can call meditation or jitta bhavana, mental development, occurs or arises in order to deal with these mental problems. When we talk about jitta bhavana or mental development, (coughs) we can look at this in two ways. 
the first is to develop the mind to make the mind progress to higher and higher things. This is one sense of meditation. Another sense is to develop other branches of human experience. However, using the mind as the tool of development. So developing things through the power of mind is another way of looking at meditation. A system of mental development must depend on the depend on natural principles. When meditating or the system of meditation cannot go against these natural principles. If we try to violate these natural laws, then we won't be successful in meditation. So it's necessary to understand and work within the limits or to harmonize with these natural principles. Mental development in Buddhism depends on this principle very clearly. This Buddhist meditation works with these natural principles in order to develop life to its highest potential within the, the laws of nature. However that may be, in the end we base this meditation in the mind, in the jitta. The jitta can mean both mind or heart in English. Our meditation is based on the mind. This is, this is where we do our study our investigation, our practice is in and with, through the mind. If we do this correctly, we will experience the success and fruits of practice, which is the solving of all our mental problems, our spiritual problems, and the experiencing of true happiness. Today, my intention is to show how the Buddhist systems of mental development or the Buddhist system of mental development can be adapted, adjusted to other forms of culture, other forms of religion in quite extensively, maybe not completely but to a great extent, this adaptation is possible. Meditation requires some preparation. We must prepare our bodies and prepare our minds. This includes preparing a proper place of meditation. It includes even preparing food or adjusting how we take food. To meditate properly, we should be interested in these natural principles about preparing the body and mind for meditation. A place that is free of disturbances is appropriate for meditation. Therefore, we should try to find such a place insofar as it is possible. If we can find, we should find the most appropriate place that we are able to without going to ridiculous extremes. Now we will speak about mental development 
directly. First is a general basic level of meditation for developing the mind so that it has strength and ability in carrying out its mental duties and responsibilities. We must have a mindfulness and a ready self-awareness and comprehension in our lives, which are called sati and sampajanya. And so we must have a way of developing this mindfulness in life. It is also necessary to have a right balanced effort in everything we do. So we must, we will also develop this inner energy, the ability to put forth effort in a proper way. We have what is called the four idipata, four idipata or or bases of success. These are these four bases of success are chanta, liya, jita, and vimangsa, which we will explain. We have ways of training so that each of these bases of success will be developed as wholly, completely, perfectly as we as is possible in each of our individual cases. We have a principle of practice which is to summon up and put forth energy or effort, having chanta itibata as the as the leader or as the dominant factor. Chanta here means satisfaction with or a healthy appetite in what we're doing. So having this this satisfaction or appetite, this interest in what we're doing, basis of success as the primary means of summoning up effort. The next is to summon up and put forth effort having Virya iti pata as the leader or dominant factor. This is putting forth effort with with virya, which is which is energy, which is which is effort itself, which is a kind of daringness, boldness of the mind. Next is to summon up and put forth energy having jitta iti bata as the dominant factor. This means having intention, the intention basis of success is the primary means of summoning up and putting forth energy and effort. And then there is summoning up and putting forth effort with vimangsa itibata as the dominant or leading factor. This is to, this vimangsa means to investigation, examination, scrutiny. This is where the effort and power of mind is generated. So if we develop all four of these bases of success, 
if we learn to develop and strengthen chanta, which is a satisfaction with an appetite for the duties that we must carry out. And then viriya, which is the ability to put effort and energy into our lives' activities, especially our responsibilities. And then jita, which is an intention, a commitment towards those duties and responsibilities. And then vimangsa is to investigate, examine, and scrutinize as we put effort into these things. These are four ways of developing the mind's abilities to higher and higher levels so that the mind is made strong, so the mind is able to successfully carry out whatever tasks are given to it. This is a mind that is, is very strong and active. You can see for yourself whether or not, decide for yourself whether or not these four principles of the Itipata can be adapted and applied in other cultures and religions. Next we come to the area of practicing to have, have kindness, friendliness, love towards all things. This area of practice is called the Brahma Vihara, which is to live in the highest, most excellent way. These are the highest dwellings, the most excellent dwelling places. The basic there is a basic formula for practicing this. We begin by developing a proper level of concentration. And then when the mind is ready to diffuse or spread a feeling of metta, a feeling of, of kindness, and friendliness, to diffuse it in all four directions. When we are, when the mind is able to continuously spread an awareness of feeling of metta, friendliness, kindness, in all four directions, this is another way of practicing. This is an unlimited or limitless, unconditioned kind of metta. When we say the, all four directions, we mean throughout the world, throughout the universe, without any limit, to spread it everywhere, without exception. The next, the next one is to spread the mind which is compassionate, the mind with karuna, which is the desire to help others, or compassion. To spread this in a, this unlimited mind in all four directions. The third is to spread mudita, the mind with mudita in all four directions. Mudita is to be, to be delighted with, to be joyful about the good fortune happiness, and happiness of others. When someone is successful at something, Mudita is to feel joy at their success, to be delighted, to appreciate it, to want to congratulate them. To spread this this feeling, the mind which feels mudita in all directions, is the third aspect. Mudita can also mean sympathy towards, towards all beings, 
all creatures, a sympathy towards um, being sensitive to the reality of others, a gentleness that allows us to be sensitive to others is also included in mudita. The fourth is ubeka. This should not be misunderstood as indifference. Properly, ubeka is when the mind, although it may be quite still, it's when the mind is observing carefully for an opportunity to help, when the mind will quietly observe, looking for a chance to help. This is what we mean by ubeka, to, to send or spread this feeling, this unlimited, boundless feeling in all four directions is another way of practice. So altogether there are these there are these four. There is spreading a boundless mind of metta, of love, friendliness, kindness in all directions. Spreading a boundless mind of karuna, the desire the heartfelt desire to help, to sacrifice for others, to serve, to spread the boundless mind of mudita, of joy at the success of others, of sensitivity and sympathy to the reality of others, and to spread the boundless mind of upeka, which is to carefully observe for a chance to help. When we can't yet help, one quietly watches, waiting, looking intently for the opportunity to help. Altogether, these are called the four Brahma Viharas, or the four excellent supreme dwellings, the four highest dwellings. This is a way, altogether, this is another way of meditating in Buddhism. You are all able to see for yourselves whether or not this principle of the four Brahma Viharas can be adapted, applied, and practiced in other cultures, in other religions. Now we come to the form of meditation or the meditation practice which is the heart or essence of Buddhism. The essential meditation in Buddhism is practice which leads to the destruction of selfishness, a practice whereby the defilement, the greed, anger, and delusion which are the forms of selfishness, a practice wherein these are destroyed. This is the essential practice of Buddhism, one that destroys, that burns up the defilement. There are two basic forms of religion. A basic difference between these two kinds or groups of religions is that there are many religions which teach that there is a self or a soul, that there is some self or soul. Then there are other religions which teach that in fact there is nothing that, there's nothing that actually exists which can properly be called a self or soul. There are these two basic forms religions take. Nonetheless, each faces the same problem of how to teach people to destroy, 
to overcome selfishness. Even if one believes in a self, one must restrain that so that no selfishness occurs. The religions that teach some kind of self or soul are in accordance with our instincts because we instinctually feel that we are a self or that we have a soul. But then this will lead to difficulties in teaching people to be unselfish. As for the religions that teach that there is no self or soul, then then it is much more simple. When there is no, when one truly realizes this fact of not self, then there is no way for selfishness to occur. This ultimately may, may be more simple, a more simple and straightforward approach. But the case is the same, or in both kinds of religion, there's still the basic need to teach people how to overcome selfishness, how to let go of all forms of selfishness. Even so, even in spite of this difference between kinds of religions, it is still possible to take principles of practice from Buddhism, which teaches not self, and apply them to apply them or adapt, adapt them for religions that teach there is a self. If in Buddhism any of these principles work in overcoming selfishness, then they should be possible to adapt them to other religions. Following will be a, a system of teaching about how to realize the truth or how to realize the truth that will free us from selfishness, something that should be applicable whether our religion teaches not self or teaches that there is some kind of a self. The very first thing to do in this approach is to develop the mind, to train the mind until it is able to very clearly and directly see or experience the reality of impermanence. To experience the fact that the various objects of experience, that experience itself, is impermanent. That all the aspects of experience of life are constantly changing. They all depend on conditions which are changing. The conditions change and then the realities based on those conditions are changing. We can say it's all a flow, that everything is flowing. So first of all, one has insight into the flow, the change, the impermanence of things. The realization of the fact of impermanence can get rid of, can eliminate certain levels of selfishness in itself, but it won't eliminate them all, so we must practice further. Next following then is to see that our lives, that life, is bound up with these impermanent things. To see that how much life is bound up and dependent upon things which don't last, which are always changing, reveals the, the fact, the difficulty of coping with 
all these things, the difficultness of life, that it's the unsatisfactoriness of these experiences. This is insight into the condition of dukkha. Dukkha means hard to endure or difficult to bear. And this in, which means unsatisfying, unsatisfactory, as well as ugly. There's things which are hard to endure, which are unsatisfying, have a sort of ugliness to them. To see, to have insight into this condition or characteristic of things is the next level. Seeing this condition of dukkha in all condition, in all impermanent things, can further destroy or eliminate more levels of selfishness, but it won't eliminate them all. Thus, it is necessary to continue practicing. The next level is the mental development which leads to seeing the fact that all things are not self, that there is nothing which should be regarded as being a self or having a self. The feeling or concept of self is a trick or illusion of, of nature. Or we can say that the mind is tricked, is deceived by things into taking them as selves or as having selves. For example, when there's, when through the nervous system we feel or experience something, we never, we don't conceive of it as being just the nervous system feels, the nervous system experiences. We always take it to be I feel, I experience. Or when there is, when there is love, it is never seen that there is love, just that there is love, or that the mind loves. It's always taken to be I love. The same with anger. Anger is not seen as just an aspect or, or activity of the mind. It's always taken to be I am angry, my anger, I am anger. This is a trick or an illusion of this sensual world. Leads us to take things in this I and my way. But in fact, it's an illusion. These things are not really me or mine. It may seem that we are doing them or experiencing them. But there is just the doing, just the experience. The we, the I, is an illusion. Once there is the concept of self, there arises the concept of, of self, or the things belonging to self. In Thai, this is expressed quite easily with the words Dua Gu and Kong Gu. Dua Gu is something like ego, the most, the crudest and ugliest manifestation of this sense of I. Once this ego appears, then there it's inevitable. One can't help but feel towards things that they are mine or they belong to ego, to this ego. Whether they're so everything related to the ego, connected to the ego, is considered as belonging to the ego, whether they're positive or negative. The ego considers them as mine. So this feeling of me 
following from this sense of me, there inevitably arises the second one, the, the mind, and the concepts that go with them. This, however, is just a further, further development of illusion. This sense of or concept of egos belonging to ego or egoism is very subtle and extensive, goes very deep. Inwardly it expresses itself in taking life to be mine. This is my life. This life belongs to ego. When in fact it belongs to nature. This life belongs to nature. But in, inwardly we regard it as being mine, my life. Externally, it takes many forms regarding my wife, my children, my husband, my home, my wealth, my possessions, my job, my country, and so on. So it spreads quite extensively to all aspects of life. Although these things are just nature and belong to nature. Due to ego, ego claims them all to be mine. They belong to me. My wife, my husband, my children, my home, my country, my religion. And so this sense of mine, this egoism, is very deep can be very refined, very coarse, it's extensive, reaching out throughout the universe. In order to eliminate all selfishness, we must eliminate this feeling or, this, or these concepts of ego, and egoism or things belonging to ego. The only way to truly eliminate ego and egoism or me and mine is to see deeply and clearly that there is nothing that can act truly be regarded as a self or as having self. To see this clearly then there is no way that the sense of self, of me and mine, the concepts of me and mine, can arise. Other religions are likely to have different ways or their own other ways <coughs> of eliminating, getting rid of selfishness. <coughs> but in Buddhism this is done by examining life deeply in order to see the truth, the natural fact that all these things just belong to nature, that we borrow them from nature, but that none of them <coughs> are actually self. None of them are actually me or mine. Although the <clears throat> profound understanding of not-self is able to decrease and eliminate all selfishness, there are still some things to, some insights or some aspects of knowledge which we ought to know as well. When there is this penetration of the fact of impermanence, unsatisfactoriness, and not self, then this, if this is seen truly, the mind realizes that this is just the way things are. Nature is just this way. This is the, the naturalness, the natural way of nature. This is just how things are in this world. This, this follows upon 
the first insight. This fact that nature is just like this, this naturalness of, of the way things are, is called Dhamma Tittata, Dhamma Tittata. If we go look into this further, by the way, when we say the natural way of things, this means expressly that things are impermanent, unsatisfying, and not self. Then looking deep, more deeply into this, one will understand why things must be this way. One, under, one sees that there is natural law which controls things or which oversees everything. And due to this natural law, things are just this way. This is called the orderliness of nature or Dhamma Niyamata, Dhamma Niyamata. This natural law which controls everything, which oversees, which has power over everything. In some religions and cultures, this might be called God because God is seen as overseeing everything, as controlling, creating and controlling all things. But in Buddhism, this is just called the natural law, or the Dhamma Niyamata. We can call this natural law can be called God if we wish, we ought to with open-mindedly observe that God is said to have power over everything, to be able to control things, so that, and that God is what makes everything the way they are. The same can be said of the natural law. Everything <laughs> is the way it is because of the natural law. It's the natural law that controls everything in the way things are. So each, in order to be open-minded towards each other's religion, we can, we need to observe that, that there's in these different words God and law or natural law, there are these comparative functions or or attributes. And so we can call, when we talk of God, one should observe that we could, it's possible to speak of a non-personal God, a God that controls everything, but which is not a person, such as the law of nature. We shouldn't just have person, a personal God. We should also understand that we can speak of a non-personal God. In this way, it is cap we will be capable of understanding each other. The law of nature forces everything to follow the law of nature, which means that everything must depend upon causes and conditions. All things rely, are interdependent with other things. So everything exists according to causes and conditions. This fact is called itapajayata, which can be translated the conditionality, the conditionality of all things in this universe. When we see all of these facts, that this is just how things are, that this is the, the natural law, and that the natural law is the conditionality of, of nature and everything within nature, then there is the insight which can be expressed in one's 
simple single word word tata da tata da the suchness or thusness of everything. Things are just like this. They're just such, merely thus. We call this the ta da, the thusness or suchness. When realizing that all things exist according in and according to these natural principles, then there one sees more sees the truth that there is nothing which can be regarded as, which can be attached to, which can be discriminated as being a self or as being related to self. There's nothing anywhere that can be found which is a self or is related to self. Self is atta, related to self is ataniya. That things are void of self and being related to self is a profound fact called sunyata, sunyata, voidness. The voidness of this universe, of all the things in the universe, means that they are void, they are empty of anything which can be regarded as, classified as, discriminated as, or attached to as self or as related to self. When the mind has passed, passed through these eight, eight stages or developments of insight, then it comes to a stillness, a stillness where it is, the mind is still in correctness, in, perf- in perfection. The mind is still means there's nothing which can shake it, nothing which can disturb it. This unshakableness, this stillness of the mind is called adhammayata, adhammayata. This is the, the highest state that the mind can enter, the state where nothing is able to shake it, where the mind is invulnerable, perfectly still. We call this atamayata. This word is quite difficult to translate. And so if we're able, it's best just to use the original term atamayata, atamayata. A-T-A-M-M-A-Y-A-T-A, Atamayata. Now, if this is the, the mind that is in perfect stillness, where nothing can touch it, shake it, or violate it. Now, if you want to have a personal God, then you could call this the, the state where the where the mind, where life is protected by God. This is the, the highest state of being under God's protection. If you wish, you can express it in those terms. Of course, the Buddhist doesn't speak in terms of a personal God. So we say it's the state of being perfectly still and unshakable in correctness. To be perfectly still in the way things are. Now, if you wanted to explain this to children, you could call it spiritual equilibrium or spiritual balance. A perfect spiritual balance is one way of ex- explaining a dhammayada. Or for adults, you might translate it as unconditionability, unconditionability or unconcoctability, the state or reality of mind which cannot be conditioned or concocted in any way. This is the meaning of adhammayata. 
the stillness and unshakability of a Dhammayada can be understood more simply by comparing it <coughs> with the great mountains, the Rockies of North America, the Alps of Europe, the Himalayas of Asia. These great mountains can still shake and tremble when there is an earthquake or an earth tremor. But the mind with Adamayata, the mind in, in this unconcoctability, cannot be shaken in the least way. It won't tremble. No matter what life brings, this mind doesn't tremble at all. Now, whether this Adamayata, <coughs> this state of perfect stillness, of unshakableness in, in righteousness or correctness, whether this can be adapted and used in other religions, in other cultures, is something for you to sort out for yourself. These nine facts or insights into the reality of things, of anicca the impermanence, the, the fact of impermanence, dukkata, the condition of being hard to endure, anatta, the non-selfhood, tamatitata, the natural way of things, tamaniyamata, the natural law, itapajayata, the conditionality, datata, the thusness, sunyata, the voidness, and adhammayata, the unconcoctability. These nine facts of things and of the mind itself, whether or not these have a place in other religions and cultures, whether they can be adapted and applied within other cultures and religions, this is something for you to examine yourself. It's something you'll be able to see your, for yourself how it is. We, we offer them to you as, as things which we are confident can be adapted in all cultures, in all religions, for the benefit of everyone within that culture and religion. Last of all, we must mention the highest form of mental development in Buddhism. This is the what meditation or jitta pavana that can be called dhamma samadhi, which is when the mind is concentrated upon, one pointed upon dhamma, upon dhamma in all its meanings. This dhamma samadhi is to take <clears throat> the highest thing as the object of the concentrated mind to meditate upon the highest thing. And this does not mean think about it. To, in Buddhism, the highest supreme thing is Nibbana. So this is to focus the concentrated mind on Nibbana. In other religions, the supreme thing may be called God, and then Dhamma Samadhi would be to concentrate upon the reality of God. How to do this in Buddhism, we'll examine now. The way to do this is to first prepare the mind so that it is fitting and proper, and then to take the highest thing, the supreme thing, as the object of this consciousness. You can call this highest thing Nibbana, you can call it God, you can call it the transcendent, whatever you call it, that highest, most supreme thing is taken as the object of consciousness. Then when the mind is firmly focused on this reality, then it is examined in the following way, etang santang, 
This is the highest, most perfect peace. Etang Banitang. This is the most subtle and sublime reality there is. Next is Sama Sankara Samato, which means this is the calming down, the stopping of all conditioning, all concocting, all the, con- all the busy concocting of the mind ceases in this supreme reality. This aspect of it is called Sapa Sankara Samato. This is the value or the highest benefit of what we call the supreme thing, that all the busy, disordered concocting of the mind ceases, ends. Next is Sabu Bati Bati Nitsako. Sabu Bati Bati Nitsako, which means the that we throw away everything that is heavy. We we toss away all burdens from life. This unburdening of life, tossing away all the heaviness of life is called Sabu Bhati Bhati Nitsako. In short, this, the highest supreme thing that we are, we have realized has caused all these burdens, all these heavy things to, to fall away. Next is <clears throat> Danhakayo, which means to end desire, the end of desire, the end of thirst, of hunger, of all wishes and wants, all desires cease. And then one is satisfied or gratified, not by satisfying desires, but because all desire is ended. This is the the highest wealth or property of the the highest of the supreme thing, that in it all desire ends, which is called Danha Kayo. Following is Virako, which literally means fading away. It means that the mind is not bound up by or tied up with anything. The mind no longer attaches to anything and nothing is attached to it. All attachment, all bonds have faded away. This is called Virako. The next is called Niroto, which is perfect quenching, quenching with nothing left over. All the fires that have been ignited in life are thoroughly quenched. There's no more heat left. All these fires have been put out. This thorough, perfect quenching is called Niroto. The last thing is Nibbanang, coolness, eternal coolness. To be cool in all respects, in all meanings, to be eternally cool. So what we do is we focus attention on the highest thing or on the attributes, the characteristics of the supreme thing, and we go through them in this way. This is called Dhamma Samadhi, to the mind that is one-pointed, totally concentrated on the highest thing, on and Dhamma. This kind of mental development can be adjusted and adapted to other, other creeds, other cultures, other religions. Anything outside of Buddhism which seeks coolness, perfect coolness, 
can adapt this approach. So in short, finally, we can say that the four bases of success, the iti pata, the four spreading the four Brahma Viharas or or most supreme and excellent dwellings in all four directions, or penetrating into these nine insights or eyes on reality, as well as this Dhamma Samati, examining the attributes of the supreme thing. All of these should be applicable, adaptable to any, any creed, any culture, or any religion, because it's clear that all human beings seek coolness. All human beings long for the, the end of suffering, the quenching of dukkha. So this is the, the, the deep, deep down natural need of all human beings, then all human creeds, cultures, and religions should be able to adapt these four forms of meditation, of jita, pawana, to, to themselves. We, we offer them to you as forms of meditation in Buddhism so that you can examine them in order to respond to your own deepest felt needs for coolness, for the end of dukkha. <clears throat> Truth is one. The highest supreme thing, the supreme thing, is one. But if we're not careful, we will think that there are many, and then we will get into disputes, arguments, in competition. So please be very careful to practice your own religion, that each of us may realize the one truth, the one supreme thing, so that we need not argue about it, need, ya, need not compete. And so, may we all benefit from jita pavana or mental development, as we have discussed today, so that through developing the mind through meditation or prayer, if you will, we can all realize the one truth as the one supreme thing. So we have examined, reflected upon the supreme truth, the supreme thing, and we have, we must ask your forgiveness for taking so long to do so. It's, we thank you for your interest in walking here and enduring in order that we all can deepen our understanding of the supreme truth, the supreme thing, so that all of us can practice in order to realize this supreme highest truth. We've considered these things so that all of us may adapt and apply them to our own lives, to our work, so that we can all be more successful in them and help to bring peace, help to manifest peace in this world. So thank you once again, and we wish you the greatest success in this endeavor. This, this ends today's talk.